Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. I had originally envisioned doing just a short series on Dune in preparation for the 2020 movie. Uh, I had timed it to end a few weeks shy of the official release date and then the release date was postponed by a year. Let's start by setting our sights on the planetoid Charon in our solar system and I will get into why that is during our flight out there. Due to the film delay, I'm repurposing this channel. You may notice that the name has changed. It is no longer the Dune Primer, but the Sci-Fi Primer. And I'm going to talk about other science fiction stories that have caught my attention. If this t is to your liking, please subscribe and leave some comments. I'd be delighted to hear from you. The next on my list is The Forever War by Joe Haldeman, released in 1974. At the start, some aliens were first encountered at the star Aldebaran in the constellation Taurus, and they are subsequently called Taurans. No Tauran has ever been seen at the start of the story, only their ships while engaged in space battles, and then only remotely and briefly. This is a story which could be classified as hard science fiction, where to a large extent the physical sciences are adhered to and factor into the story to some extent. It also sits in the genre of military science fiction, and you can probably tell from the title, along with titles such as Starship Troopers and War of the Worlds to some extent. In fact, the author of Starship Troopers, Robert Heinlein, told Joe Haldeman that the Forever War was the best military sci-fi he'd ever read, so that's not nothing. I'd also like to note the star Formalot, uh, Fomalot, since it's mentioned as the first star visited by humans in the story, and there it is right there. The story begins in the distant future, the year 1997. Some military trainees are headed to the outer solar system in order to do some low temperature training. In this timeline, humans are already doing interstellar travel by the year 1997, and in fact earlier than 1997 because by 97 we'd already managed to tick off some aliens. Now I like the way that interstellar travel is achieved here. The author suggests that there are these stellar phenomena called collapsars, kind of akin to a black hole. If you fly right into the center of one of these at relativistic speeds, then you'll pop out of another collapsar somewhere else in the universe instantaneously, depending on where you're pointing. Because a large amount of the time is spent in accelerating to and decelerating from relativistic speeds, time dilation becomes a factor that plays greatly into the evolution of the story, as you'll see. Around these collapsars are frigid planets that the trainees are preparing for by going to the outer solar system. kind of like uh, where I'm going here. And uh, this is where it gets interesting, astronomically speaking. The recruits are going to the planet Charon. We know Charon as the moon of Pluto, but recall that the book came out in 1974 before Pluto's moon was discovered in 1978. The author gave the name of Charon to an imaginary planet, having twice Pluto's orbit, predicting the name of what was to be discovered a few years later. Charon in ancient Greek mythology was the ferryman that brought the dead over the river Styx to the underworld. If you ever do ride across on his boat, don't pay the ferryman until he gets you to the other side, or so I've heard. At Charon, they're going to train in near absolute zero temperatures. This comes with many challenges, including avoiding getting a space suit's heat sink in contact with liquid hydrogen or face deadly consequences. The recruits are selected from the best humanity has to offer, each having an IQ of 150 or more and being in top physical form. This adds to the tragedy of the demise of many of these young men and women, as many of them will die ignoble deaths, either by accident or misadventure. This had me thinking of the tragedy of war. I think of great writers like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien serving in World War I, had they died, we would have never read their works. 
But then if they hadn't gone to war, maybe they wouldn't have written those stories in the first place. Another tragedy of World War I was a brilliant scientist, Henry Moseley, who was in line to get the Nobel Prize in Physics, who died at Gallipoli. These are the kinds of young people that are featured in The Forever War, young geniuses used as cannon fodder. Just the training is brutal. Eleven recruits die and one gets dismembered. Their task is to build shelters and set up defenses in this inhospitable climate. At the same time, they're practicing drills and live fire training exercises. Here we are at Charon, the moon of Pluto. While we're here, I wanted to also have a look at the in-game representation of Pluto. The reason is that uh, the game came out in 2014, but the first ever close-up picture of Pluto was only ever taken in 2015. Therefore, I'm curious to see if the game database was updated to match the realistic view of Pluto or not. I'll be looking for this heart-shaped discoloration on the surface. I'm not seeing the heart, so I suspect that the graphics are the original from uh, before the New Horizons probe reached Pluto. You can go visit the New Horizons probe in-game, as well as the two Voyagers. You can find them in di the Discovery Scan under the Signal's Ancient Probe, in case you're interested. Right, so after they're done training on Charon, they will fly out to a place called Stargate, which is where the nearest Collapsar is situated, I gather, about a half light year away from Earth, so they're flying at uh, relativistic speeds. They use their experience from Charon to expand the base at Stargate and, and learn that their next uh, destination is a planet around Epsilon Origa. Origa. Uh, HIP 23416 for you astronomically minded people out there. So that's our episode for today. I will leave the story of the encounter at Epsilon Origa for the next installment, and I hope to see you all there. And bye for now.